I uh, will start now. Thank you all for coming and welcome. Uh, my name is Matthew Klugman and it's my privilege uh, to be chairing uh, today's session with the extraordinary Sandy O'Sullivan, Professor O'Sullivan. Uh, I'd like to first begin by acknowledging uh, that we're here gathered on the lands of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation on the lands of Bunjil here. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past and present and to note that these lands, like all the lands of this continent and surrounding islands, were stolen and have never been ceded. They always were and they always will be Aboriginal land and the Torres Strait Islander land at the top. I'd like to also recognise and acknowledge the people here from the many different Aboriginal nations of this continent and surrounding island, along with Torres Strait Islanders as well. This event is sponsored by Mundani Bullock, the Institute for Health and Sport, the Community Identity and Displacement Research Network and the Victoria University Pride Network. I'd like to thank all of those organisations as well. We've been blessed with Sandy being able to come down here and spend, no, not just for tonight, but spend uh, a month with us, which has been extraordinary. Not through it all, but still extraordinary. I'd like to also acknowledge that for you as an institution uh, and many of us working with it, kind of working to be uh, committed to anti-colonial practices and that this is part of it and learning from Professor O'Sullivan in their wisdom around that is a key thing and talking earlier about how acknowledgements of country also have to tie into questions of what what does that mean and land back and reparations you know that's as, what it means land back and yeah. reparations <laughs> yeah as as foundational elements of it. So, yeah. thank you also like to say that victoria university is proudly a trans affirming institution and transphobia is one of the many forms of hate speech which are disallowed on this campus for the deadly violence that they do. If anyone expresses hate speech during this, they will be asked to leave. And of course, it would be glorious if we didn't have to make that comment, but we live in a time of ever-increasing systemic violence uh, around um, the issues that Sandy's going to be talking about, particularly around gender diversity, transness. Uh, and then compounding extra violence, particularly in this incredibly difficult lead up to a referendum uh, that the government has called, um, that it means that there's a whole heap of anti-blackness and anti-Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander and more broadly Indigenous sentiments as well. Professor Sandy O'Sullivan is a Wiradjuri transgender non-binary person since 1991, they've taught and researched across gender and sexuality, museums, the body, performance design, and First Nations identity. They're also a future fellow with a project titled Saving Lives, mapping the influence of indigenous LGBTIQ plus creative artists. And that project explores the unique contributions and influence of queer artists to understand how modeling complex identities contributes to the well-being of First Nations people and is tied into the presentation that Professor O'Sullivan is going to do. There is no session on the colonial project of gender. So thank you. You can join me in welcoming Sandy. That's quite a lot of pressure. Thank you. Um, so I want to um, start by acknowledging that sovereignty within these lands is not ceded. There's been no session. Um, I acknowledge the wealth of, of community formed by um, Wurundjeri, Wurrawurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin nations. Um, we acknowledge obviously that this land is theirs uh, and not just that it's never ceded but that the only way that we can really acknowledge it is to talk about land back and to talk about reparations as well. Um, there's an interesting moment in this talk where there's a discussion of that um, and it's probably in the grand scheme of things the, was the most shocking for me in the research that I've done recently um, and you, you, might, you, you might feel the same way. Um, so 
In the Murray Wittengala is often framed for people as the um, wisdom of respectfully knowing how to live well in a world that's worth living in. It, it sort of means that, but it sort of means more. It's this idea of why wouldn't you make somewhere um, better when you know that it's possible. Um, so it's all of those things. And, and all of the research that I do, hopefully I live my life like that, but I also centre the research that I do with that. And I, I think it's really important that we do that um, and that we do that work to understand how we can improve the world. Uh, so that was a lot of mm, these terrible things are happening at the moment, but actually they're also the joy. And I wanted to kind of pitch it in the introduction to be talking about some of that joy and then to go through some of the complexity, I suppose. So, um, so I'll start with relationality as everything um, and so are introductions. So, oh, um, that's, uh, uh, I'm looking a bit green tinged there, sorry, <laughs> it hasn't quite worked. Uh, I look much better on this screen. Um, that's uh, my late sister Gina, who, who died a couple of months ago, and that's my, uh, one of my nieces, uh, got a very, very big family, um, so we're gonna get the whole lot. Uh, Kylie, who, uh, as you can see, uh, we uh, hit her up at work. Um, and uh, that was a couple of years ago. I think it's, and, and she is about 41 or 42 there. Um, this is one of the sort of crucial parts of how I talk about gender, but I think actually how everyone talks about gender is in relationship, um, even if it's within the binary. So I want to now just do a little bit of an introduction to where I work. Um, and I really want to thank everyone here, um, obviously Madani Balak and CIDRN and Matthew and, and uh, VU Pride Network, but also just everyone here for coming so that we can share some of these ideas as well. Um, where I work in the Centre for Global Indigenous Futures uh, and these are the themes that we cover off on. I work in, largely in the intimacies um, theme, but I do some work in the digital futures area as well. And I do work in future worlds because uh, actually containers are the problem. And so the idea of categories that don't lead into other categories are actually part of the broader colonial project. So we disrupt it, but we try to provide some descriptions that people can feel connected to in some way. So, and this is not an introduction, this is an introduction. Um, so these are some of the people that I work with and I'll, I'll finish by talking about myself a little bit, but not too much, um, because you've kind of heard my story uh, in terms of my work, but there's a broader story of me messing up quite a lot, and it's not quite how I phrased it um, recently. So this is Andy and Maddie, who I work with, Centre Researchers. Uh, Hannah Rose Barracliffe, Mika Michaela Saunders. I strongly suggest that you familiarise yourself with these fabulous people who are doing remarkable work. We have a lot of trans non binary people who work in the centre. We centre on complexity, that's why. Uh, indigenous futures, yeah, like the only people who can talk about indigenous futures are indigenous people. Um, and how we talk about it is by talking about the expansiveness of who we are. Um, Inez, Tamika, Zach, Tate, and then of course it's global. So we've got uh, we've got uh, uh, Joseph Pierce, who's over at Stony Brook in New York. Uh, we've got Moana Theodore, who has actually just left University of Otago and is now working in community. Very um, thankfully, uh, said never again at a university. I'm always going to work for community from here on in. Uh, Marissa Duarte, who does remarkable work across the online space, like Bronwyn Carlson, who works with us. Um, and Tristan Kennedy, who's come here actually now as professor, sorry, that should be updated, and is now at uh, Monash as PVC Indigenous. Uh, and then um, Inkarani Sara, who is a Sami scholar who does remarkable work and actually led a, um, a, a Sami issue, uh, free access if anybody wants to read it, uh, on our Journal of Global Indigeneity uh, that covers off on a whole lot of things for Sami community. If you don't, do people know where Sami communities are? Does anybody not know? You can put up your hand, I won't be calling you out. Yeah, okay, so it's, so it's across parts of, um, of the area that's, uh, that's 
framed as the Nordic region, so including Skanda countries um, and beyond. So, so it's an indigenous, sorry, they are an indigenous group, but they're actually multiple groups uh, that are across uh, five countries, arguably six, including Russia um, and, uh, and Finland and uh, have a relationship with ethnic Finns uh, and their centred work out of the university, the Sami University, is to do a lot of the work that um, is allied with uh, Sami Parliament, which is placed in northern Norway. And so they do some remarkable work there, including in queer studies, though they're mostly centred in reindeer studies. Um, and then we have Grace Dillon, who coined the phrase Indigenous Futurisms, uh, we're very fortunate to have Grace as a member of the, the team. Alex Wilson, who uh, works uh, out of a couple of places, University of Saskatchewan, and then does the land-based uh, master's program that looks at land and looks at the way that Indigenous people use land um, in, uh, at uh, University of Winnipeg. Um, and then Leanne Holt, who has just left us to become Pro Vice Chancellor at um, Uni of New South Wales, but continues to be uh, in our future worlds area. And of course, Bromwell Carlson, who is kind of the star of the show <laughs> and is a remarkable scholar, working across a whole lot of spaces, but particularly across the, um, the space of, of the online slash digital world. Um, and if you are ever working in that space, you really should read her work and I'll be featuring her, uh, I'll come back to her and we'll be featuring her a little later and yes, it's all about the selfies but sort of is. You know, this is, oh, again, sorry about the green tinge. Um, this is uh, a, a really important way that we gather together um, and that we connect together um, and, uh, and it is about joy and sometimes this is seen to be uh, a little um, extra or certainly unnecessary in the space of Indigenous studies. And of course, we kick back at that and kind of say, fuck you, but also say, yes, it is. You know, what we're about is centering what we feel and what we care about and what our families care about and what our community cares about. And that's complex. Um, and it's important to reflect that. So Gawin is they, them, theirs. Well, it's, we don't have a gendered pronoun in Wiradjuri language. So, um, so Gawin is a non-gendered they, them, if you like. Um, and there are more languages in the world that, have, that use this than don't, um, that use some way of describing a person rather than necessarily pushing people into the gender binary. I'm not doing some sort of revisionist thing of saying the gender binary doesn't exist in other places. I also really, really dislike this notion that the gender binary is something that uh, is somehow a, a, a native or natural world experience. Uh, all communities have it. One of the reasons why I often focus on the European experience is a way to not make Indigenous people utility in this, which I think is deeply problematic when it comes to thinking about gender. So. So I talk about no session um, in the colonial project of gender, and I think it's important to use the, the word session here to talk about conceding. There's never been an agreement on this, but there's never been an agreement on any of these colonial containers. This isn't just about we don't have sovereignty. Of course, it's about we don't have sovereignty, but it's also really clearly about what it means to be centred in our own lands and not have to continually define ourselves and push ourselves into spaces where we're known by other people. And so this is about saying we don't have to make that space, we don't have to make that shape. Um, and so uh, unfortunately we do. <laughs> in fact what's happened is these containers are exactly what we've been um, forced into. And so a lot of the work that we do at the centre is about forcing ideas outside of those expected. And so we look at complexity. So it won't surprise you to hear that we centre queer Indigenous people because it's an example, well, because queer Indigenous people matter, but also because it's an example of the complexity of people. If people are suddenly going, I'm sorry, but I'm not interested in queer people, that just doesn't sound Indigenous to me, well, there's your problem. Um, and 
So and it wasn't me that did that. I came much later from this being um, an idea that was set by Bronwyn Carlson, who would tell you is um, is uh, uh, cisgendered and um, and heterosexual. <laughs> so uh, not to you know pass the slurs or anything. Always was, always will be. Um, indigenous survivance is a really interesting. Uh, it's an interesting concept, and it's the concept that we use um, when we talk about our work at, um, at the centre, but it's the, it's the one that's really helped me understand why I didn't have to come up with a bunch of proof. You know, proof is such a problem. Uh, it's, it's a, there's, there's actually a lot of evidence, if you like, but proof says there has to be something that explains that 5,000 years ago, one person thought that somebody outside of the gender binary um, existed and they marked it down in some way. And then now, 5,000 years later, we can all agree on that. Proof, a burden of proof, is a really strange thing to have when it comes to the gender binary or gender in general. Um, and, and yet, it's mo what most of us are subject to persistently. So not just in talking about the history, but in our everyday lives. So the way that we're believed is through some kind of process of act and enact and description. And so part of what we do is we say with this something that is almost like a, a, a I think an important beginning, middle and end to this, which is to say if we exist now, if I exist now as a trans person in 2023, people like me existed thousands of years ago and we will exist in thousands of years. This is the central part of indigenous survivance, is to say there are no mistakes with this. If we exist now, then we will exist, and we have existed. Even if the language was different, even if we were unable to, and again, trying to go back and reclaim something that may not have been possible for some communities or may have been lost or taken <coughs> in other instances is not the point. The always was and always will be has been reframed uh, and often by us as Aboriginal land. Aboriginal land always was, always will be, absolutely. But it's, there's also a connection between ad Aboriginal land and Aboriginal people. And so the notion of always was, always will be is that it's not mutable. So a trans person who's Aboriginal is a trans person who's Aboriginal. And so somebody who exists outside of the binary is somebody who exists outside of the binary gender. And those containers are going to force in, in very obvious ways. And you know, one of the most um, difficult ones to, I guess, talk about, uh, but it's very easy to find historical record of it, is through ideas of, um, of the, the notation of reproduction. So that there are only men and women when men and women are utility when people are not allowed to describe themselves but are described in terms of their utility of reproduction or not reproducing. And this happens to almost every community that has been colonised. In fact, it happens to every... It's the definition of, of colonisation. It is these containers where nothing sits outside of it. And we see it often with, um, with European uh, colonisation in this continent, really simply in the idea of how the margins were used when people were, um, would, were sent here um, as convicts, the writing in the margin, um, some of the work of Paul Carter, for instance, defines this notion that everything that sits outside of this kind of central story is the explanations and the extra material and you know what you don't know about that person, what you don't know about their relationships. And we have that in that kind of very brief colonial record, but we've got some notation there. Um, mostly we don't. Mostly we don't have that because it just wasn't conceived of. We were conceived as small, as narrow, as, as animals. You know, and when you conceive people as animals that you're going to move around, and that you're going to need to avoid or manage, um, then you certainly don't start talking about the complexity of people. So the work I'm doing is, sorry, I'm about to move to interesting photos uh, soon, but 
the work I'm doing is, is this. It's on these ideas of resistance, our right to complex identity. And so gender becomes an example of it. And it's a really, really solid example, and it's an important example right now, largely because of the disinformation is about narrowing the possibility of who people can be. You know, it's about saying you cannot have complexity. If you have complexity, if you put yourself above the parapet, then you have to expect to be targeted. You know, so that we have this work that we need to do that challenges that. And the no session is about saying there is no agreement to this and that we start with that idea. Uh, this is the project that I'm working on. I won't, uh, you don't have to read any of that, um, except maybe the last thing is I may be doing that, I may not. Um, but, you know, this is, this is looking at the complexity of the way that we tell our stories. Um, this is how we tell our complexities and why we tell our complexities. What the fuck does it mean to people to have that? So, you know, what does it mean to not have that? You know, what does it mean to never be able to tell that story or never be able to see yourself represented? And so our work is around that. Um, sorry, that was maybe the royal way with that. My work is around that. Um, and the people that I get to work with add complexity to that because, of course, they do. So I um, did this, uh, this piece came out not long ago and it's in an open access uh, piece that I think some of you might have seen. Um, so it's called Fucking Up, Fixing Up and Standing Up to the Colonial Project of Gender and Sexuality. I reckon if you saw that I wrote something like, or someone like me wrote something like this, you might think that I'm calling out museums and places for being bad, but actually I'm talking about myself. I really messed up. I made a huge blunder when I was working on a project um, for about nine years where I looked at 470 museums. Um, so I visited 470 museums over a yeah, nine year period uh, and they were, it was all about looking at the capacity for national museum spaces to reflect and engage First Nations communities. And in 2017, and I detail it in here, so I won't go into huge detail about it, but I'll just say University of Winnipeg put together uh, an amazing uh, queer um, symposium that was looking at museums and art galleries and First Nations peoples, and they said, oh, this is the area that you work across. Can you come and, uh, and, and do a keynote and maybe do a workshop? And I said, sure, I'd love to. And I realised, and then it was like three months later, I realised that I hadn't really looked at queerness in the whole thing, even though I'd worked in queer studies and worked in Indigenous museums. I had noted it, and it was there in my work, and when I went back through, I, I saw that it was there. But it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I don't even know how that happened, um, except I do know how it happened. It did happen, and it was me doing a whole lot of colonial work. It was me doing a whole lot of making spaces smaller. And it was also, it wasn't very apparent in museums. And I only properly discovered that this year when I went back and visited some of these ones in international spaces and I realised that they had fuck all. Um, it was remarkable how little stuff they had about um, queer Indigenous people. It was ridiculous. Even when they had queer Indigenous artists there. So they weren't talking about queerness unless it was completely centred on that. Uh, which was fascinating. There were some absolute exceptions, <laughs> and I've got some photos of those. But, you know, I, uh, again, I talked about this before, and some people might have um, um, heard me talk about this before, but I'll just go through this briefly and then go to the more interesting recent stuff. So, um, yeah, I visited the Creation Museum some years ago. I me meant to do a revisit this time, but I, I, I ran out of time, it's probably wise. They've now got a, um, a, a reproduction of um, Noah's Ark. Um, so I sort of really wish I could see that. And, you know, before anyone goes, oh, of course, it's in Kentucky, it's worth noting that the previous director and then the new director are both Australian. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that's, yep, yeah, that's a child playing dangerously close to a dinosaur because they lived at the same time. So, so people often think of this when they think of getting things really wrong in this space. And... <coughs> You know, and they think of these kinds of reactive spaces, like this male and female stuff that they've got in there. They only put it out when people started to talk about, you know, gender diversity in a way that went beyond um, uh, the gender binary uh, about six or seven years ago, when it started to enter the zeitgeist, that is, people have been talking about it for a lot longer. 
I'd argue, several thousand years. Um, but, you know, for them, it suddenly was uh, a thing to challenge. And one of the tricky things about the Creation Museum is that their work is largely not edifying. It's mostly about challenging things that other people do and say. And again, I could talk more about that and I've written a fair bit about it. But, but it wasn't those sorts of spaces. It was going to somewhere like the British Museum. And look, this is was a fantastic project. This was a project that really solved a massive problem for me in the research that I was doing at the time because they were talking about Ice Age art. They were talking about First Nations peoples in the context of, of Europe, right? It was great. I suddenly had people who were unafraid about talking about this kind of connection and this deep connection. And, you know, the arrival of the modern mind, you know, so it was talking really about the idea that 30,000 years ago, uh, 36,000 years ago, there were, there were people who were making, and they were making in this way that was really complex and it wasn't just you know, a replica of what they were seeing, it was, it was doing some other work. And, uh, and Jill Cook is a remarkable, I feel like I really have to say that, and I have in everything that I've written about this particular piece, Jill is a remarkable curator and writer. Um, however, uh, like many other curators, they fall into a single trap that has been the central work that I've found through this, and that I then, in this last bit of research that I've done, have kind of done a little bit more work on. And that's, uh, here's some other examples of, this is from their website. Um, there's a lot of sexing and gendering that happens. Um, so when we look at Lion Man, Lion Man is, uh, I mean, arguably in German it's not man, but, you know, but is usually framed as he, him, his, in fact, uh, if we go to here, you can see this piece from Jill, and it's like, his gaze, like his sense, is powerful. I mean, it's not a he, whatever it is, it's like a clump of, you know, stone. Um, and obviously, I, for anybody who knows the issue with Lion Man, there is an issue with Lion Man, it may not be as old as they think. Um, but if it were, it's 40,000 years old, uh, 38,000 uh, BCE. And, uh, and certainly we know Vitus of Willendorf is, is that sort of age and that they tend to be the two figures that I spend a little bit of time thinking about because they're well known. Um, but this whole he, him, his about something that's not even figured as human, uh, you know, is bizarre. But it's this idea of, but they're standing up straight and that's probably a penis unless it's a pubis. And so it's the sexing like chickens. You know, it is this kind of idea that not even human in this instance, but sort of definitely human because let's put some, you know, pronouns in there that prove it. And the same thing happens with the Willendorf figurine, who, you know, is always framed as a woman, frequently though recently not so much framed as a maternal figure, as a pregnant figure. There's much more of a thought that this is a perspective look. And the reason that I challenge that the Willendorf figurine is automatically necessarily the woman she her is I look like the Willendorf figurine. You know, and I'm not a woman and I don't use she her. How do we know what people thought 40,000 years ago for heaven's sakes? You know, how do we know how they conceived of that? What we do as curators is that, or as anyone telling a story, is that we use what we think now and we tell people like it's the truth, but it's bullshit. You know, it's not the truth and it's really not the truth because we have to build a kind of bridge. But what if we built a bridge that actually included people, that didn't exclude people, actually, <laughs> is the other way to say it, um, that didn't do that work? And, you know, what would that mean? Uh, and how would that work? And there are lots of examples. Um, uh, in fact, even at the Museum of London, there's some very interesting examples of that. But uh, again, I'll try and scoot through these so I can actually get through uh, this. But, you know, this whole prehistoric Peruvian woman was a big game hunter. Also, maybe not a woman. Um, but they found... Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I think it's 18 uh, figures. 18 slash 19. They weren't sure about the 19th. And they sexed them, sort of. Um, and because they weren't sure after that period of time. But they kind of sexed them and said, out of the 200 plus figures, to have that many who are uh, dressed like men means that women must have been big game hunters because you couldn't have that many. Why? 
Why couldn't you? <laughs> based on what? Um, based on what exactly? And so all of this is supposition. It's guesswork. Um, and it's guesswork that's about how audiences feel, you know, and it's, but it's not. It's guesswork about how curators feel. And of course, one of the problems is who the curator is matters in this. So the kind of breadth of curatorial practice is the thing that we're really worried about. You know, so do we have an expansive curatorial uh, practice or do we have a narrowed one? Is it the British Museum where people are paid so poorly that the majority of people who work there are either going to move on to somewhere else or are moneyed? That's a problem, <laughs> you know, and there are lots of other, you know, complex issues around curatorial practice too that's around conservativeness that's nothing to do with the curators but to do with their bosses um, or the boards. So, but there are examples of this. We have neutrality in some of this. This is uh, from New Dead Money. Um, and, you know, it's a piece that they couldn't quite work out the sex of. Um, so they couldn't sex it. So they didn't try and gender it as a result. It's a, you know, an item from um, 4,000 years ago. Again, this is some language that's used. I often use this slide to prove a different thing, which is actually around the fact that they talk about people existing in the Thames Valley uh, 450,000 years ago, so we're not talking about modern humans. But what's interesting about this is that the language doesn't necessarily evoke gender, but it doesn't evoke nothing. You know, it's talking about people. So it's doing that work. And in case you thought this might have been stuff that was happening elsewhere and a while ago, yeah, they were. Um, this is happening in Canberra right now. Um, this is feared and revered, feminine power through the ages. And a lot of the same stuff is present there. This is Aphrodite, Venus, um, um, CE. Some gorgeous work in there. It's also put on, uh, curated by the British Museum. Um, and there's a lot of problems with the way that they've corralled ideas of femininity and connecting it to bodies. So there's a problem in terms of the, the not just the way that the gender binary is kind of ignored, but also the way that there is no possibility of any kind of transness um, in the binary. So deeply problematic um, in that rendering. Uh, I've got lots to say about it, but I won't say it here. So I come back to um, this, this idea that I've really messed up. And as I start to review this, I also go back to the Yindamara and Ghana. And I, I told you I was going to circle back round to talk about Bromwell, which I will, after I go through this, I spent some time in the US uh, three months of this year, and I went to the Calgon Museum, Calgon Hall of Fame, sorry, Calgon Museum and Hall of Fame, um, which was fantastic. Um, but I'm just gonna remind you about this, <laughs> which I actually wrote before 13th of July, um, before I traveled, um, and uh, this was, you know, it's really an amazing space, a wonderful celebration of women in, um, in these very, very um, difficult spaces, uh, but also a kind of celebratory space. It's, you know, quite women-centred. Um, and um, there was some remarkable stuff. This was as I walked in, if you like, so I'm kind of walking in. It's quite a big space. It's probably um, the so maybe two thirds of the size of Melbourne Museum, so it's you know pretty big space, uh, multiple floors. And as I was walking around, you know, I kind of recognised some of the um, uh, some of the designers and certainly some of the people who wore the the clothes, and it was wonderful to see it. And then um, there was an amazing. Uh, celebration of who they were framing as cowgirls. Uh, and they have a very interesting framing of that. And then I walked into this space um, and um, I remember that, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I went, why is there a picture of a man in here? I really thought that. Uh, it's not a man. <laughs> They're not a man, actually, they're a woman. And um, what the fuck was going on with me? 
but optics work that way sometimes. I'm not excusing myself, I'm obsessing up to it. But this is one of the things is, you know, this is about understanding the complexity of gender, but it's also, this is a highly conservative place, it's in Fort Worth. Um, it is very centred on the idea of telling a kind of heteronormative story. So we're not seeing a lot of queerness there. Actually, we're seeing quite a bit of queerness, but it's not named as queer. Um, so that, oh, I should have looked it up. I can't think of the name of the um, person who did all the horse training for Game of Thrones. But I often use the example, especially when I can remember the name, that in a lot of cases, when we see these kinds of images, for instance, we see, um, we read a little bit about their relationship to their husband if they were married. We read a bit about their children if they have kids. So there are about 20 different wonderful portraits, uh, some um, paintings and some uh, photographs, uh, large format. Uh, you know, I realise that you can't really see that from here, but they're really big and they're really impressive and they really do tell a story about the person. And, uh, and then we come to yeah, the person who uh, is the, the horse master for, um, uh, for Game of Thrones and there's no discussion of the fact that she works with her wife. So suddenly we have this ridiculous erasure of queerness um, and there's other erasures of queerness too. There's many erasures of aceness um, from people who report, I'm not talking about me, you know, having a, a guess, I don't do guesswork either. You know, obviously you can't call out guesswork and then do it. Um, <laughs> apparently I probably should do it a bit more. Um, and of course I'm there for two reasons. One is to see if there's queerness in there of any kind and it's named or it's present or it's, or I know about it because I know who the people are. And the other reason that I'm there is to see if there's indigenous representation in the space. And so where we see indigenous representation is outside in front of the fucking grate, um, which is Sacagawea, who was put there only three years ago, five years ago. Um, so only a couple of, uh, 15, 16 years after the formation of the museum, finally there's somebody who's indigenous who's placed there and then put into the Cowgirl Hall, Hall of Fame. Um, so moving on, just so that I can get through this stuff, but. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the, the field. The field was a uh, field museum in Chicago, this one, in their Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories, did have a story. Now, I visited uh, at this stage, yeah, weirdly I worked out, it, was, it wasn't, it was about 43 at the time, but if eventually I visited 47, which is like a tenth of the amount that I did with the last project. Um, and I kind of knew this was going to be the place where I would see some queerness or I hoped it would be, because the Field Museum has always been one of the more interesting museums. Um, so at Chicago often, it, it, there's a reason. Uh, indigenous curators, you know, the more that you have somebody who comes from a community who's there, the more likely you're gonna get representation. And this is the close-up piece. So this is um, somebody who uh, was a man that they say had been born with the name Cora Anderson. Um, and so this is a really, really interesting story. It's written by Kaimanosh Pyle, who is a, a trans academic who um, comes from the area. So it's, it's centred in the area, it's centred in the space, and it tells a story that's more than 100 years old and it's really fascinating. We had so, have some of those stories here, actually. Um, but I'm wanting to show the stories in another place, because in some ways, talking about that other place is easier for us. Um, and easier for First Nations people who might be in the room as well, uh, unless you come from there. Uh, it's the way that people are talking about it too. So this is, um, this idea of disruptions, um, our own truth showing through, this is the Choctaw Cultural Centre in, um, southern Oklahoma, sorry, either northern Texas or southern Oklahoma is near the border. Um, and it is a remarkable space, uh, really remarkable, but they do a lot of work on rethinking body shape. And so they do a lot of work that's on, in their Choctaw Proud work of saying, this is who we are. And I'm really interested in that complexity of bodies uh, I think it's incredibly important. Nobody else is going to do that. It can only come from community, right? Uh, 
Um, this is the National Museum of the American Indian in um, New York, not the one in DC, obviously both Smithsonian museums. And again, these disruptions, this was a ridiculously disruptive piece called Native New York. Have you ever heard somebody from New York say, I'm a native New Yorker? Yeah. And so they disrupt that and say, no, you're not. <laughs> and let's look at Native New York. And it's really disruptive. You know, a lot of the work that the NMAI does is talking to its, its own community. It's interesting, even though obviously there's a lot of tourists that go in there. It has this, uh, this brief to really provide this enriching space in own country, uh, connected to the communities that are there. Um, and then I managed to see, this isn't a surprise, right, to see a, um, a two-spirit powwow, a powwow generally, that, um, but one that is focused on two-spirit people, uh, which if you don't know the term, it's a term that means queer people, LGBTIQA plus people. Um, and uh, for some people. It, it was coined in uh, 1989, so it's a relatively new term. Um, and it's a term that's used across Turtle Island, so Turtle Island being often what we think of as blurred boundaries, but the, the US and, and Canada, and a lot of people would say um, Mexico. And, uh, and Two-Spirit Power ha happens in multiple places now. There's actually one happening right now um, over on the West Coast. But this is in Toronto, on Toronto, and uh, it's a remarkable space. But what makes it remarkable <laughs> is the people, and also um, spending time there and having people who are uh, who have kind of com complexity of their identity that they're not willing to kind of put aside, um, but are centering in that way. And and two spirits a problematic term, and it's a really helpful term. Because terms work like that. They're good for some people and they're not for others. And so people challenge it and they embrace it. And so we're, this is an interesting problem for us on this continent because we don't have a term that works like that. Um, we don't have a whole lot of, it's also a little bit pan-Indigenous to be doing that. It's, it's sort of problematic. We might have done it some time like 89, but it's kind of problematic to do it now. And language can be very tricky. You know, we've got people saying, um, sister girl, brother boy automatically as kind of trans people, but there's lots of people, myself included, that don't want a double binary, you know, infantilizing term to describe myself, like which one am I supposed to be? You know, and this is, in, it, so in a lot of ways, and also, well, you know, sister girl has been used for anybody who's older, who's Aboriginal, maybe even non-Indigenous in, in the audience, you might know that Sister girl was always used for cis people. <laughs> you know, it was what we said. We always said sister girl to talk about cis people and trans people. Well, there wasn't a distinction. So the way that it's used now is important for the people that it's important for. You know, it's important because it matters to the people that it matters to. And so it's not to dismiss that, but it's just to say you can't have these single terms. But people love, by people I mean non-Indigenous people, love single terms because it's comfortable. And sometimes Indigenous people love it too because it's comfortable and it's easier. Um, and I, I get that because bits of me would like it too. This is actually really what it was. Um, without being green. Um, but, you know, this is what it was. It was a whole lot of um, um, trans, two-spirit, um, queer people and Brahmin. Um, so, uh, now I want to really briefly talk about this. Um, this, is, uh, this is a selfie with three people uh, who, so I was invited to the um, Indigenous Children's Health Conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and it was an amazing conference. There, there were uh, about three to 400 um, uh, people who came into the plenary I was invited to, to sit on with these three people. And uh, they were almost all of them either working across the kids' health area or they were um, uh, paediatricians, and more than half were paediatricians. And so I don't know if anyone here knows how many Indigenous paediatricians we have in Australia, so-called Australia. Anyone? Anyone want to guess how many Indigenous paediatricians we have? Come on, be bold. 
Zero is how many we have, zero. Indigenous paediatricians, we have none. Um, we've got people who have some paediatric specialisation um, but, and they're working towards it and we will have more. But, um, and the reason I know that is I, I checked um, pretty extensively. I hope I'm wrong, I'd be really happy to be wrong, let me just say. Uh, there's three people who are paediatricians, guess what else they are? They're paediatricians from Turtle Island and they're um, three, uh, the framing is native people, that's the way that they frame themselves. Um, they're two-spirit. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> so, yeah. So they, so they actually have at least three people who are two-spirit as well as uh, two of whom are trans. So doing a plenary with them to talk about um, trans-affirming care in Oklahoma, which that same week had, uh, had put through legislation that meant that a number of communities, but then finally all, would not have access to um, trans-affirming care of any kind, uh, was important, but it was also important because federally recognised tribes have opportunities that don't exist for states, basically, in the US, and they have the opportunity to override state rights in terms of health. And so it was speaking to people who work in those communities and saying, what if you did this? What if this was going to be a solution to what we needed? And to provide some options and some alternatives in terms of the support, because a lot of the support that was required was psychological support, as you can imagine. Almost all of them have pretty deep restrictions on what's possible for kids. And the framing of kids obviously went way beyond 18. Um, in you know, the, the landscape of how paediatric care works in the US, it's typically to 25, so it goes beyond that as well. But it was also talking about what happens with puberty blockers. There was a whole lot of discussion. And we had almost the entire group of people who were in there listening. And it was really interesting. And we had me there, which was really terrible. I was there because I'd been doing work with parents of gender diverse kids, but I'm the wrong person in the room. You know, and we had to address that and say, this should be someone else. And I don't even like that. It's like when non-Indigenous people say, one day an Indigenous person will do this. You know, it's the same thing. It's, you know, it's this kind of nonsense of, well, let's be embarrassed and make that happen. Um, let's make sure that there's an understanding with anyone who's doing paediatric work that these are the possibilities, but also link them up with these people who are doing complex care for kids. Um, the really um, sad thing, you know, the work I'm doing is on creative practice and on creativities. Um, I'm on a WhatsApp group with the three of them. The artwork that they share, that they do, it's just, it's out of this world fantastic. And I can't believe that people who are paediatricians are that talented on top of it. But of course they are. You know, of course they're interested in that space of being able to tell a story and being able to share. Um, in other kinds of practice. So I did find some solutions, and I, I wanted to just range this before I do the circling around to talking about bronze stuff and then um, just quickly go through a few other slides. Um, so this is Lynn Riggs. Does anyone know who Lynn Riggs is? Matthew, you can't say yes, or anyone else who heard me talk about Lynn Riggs the other day. Does anyone know? No, had you not heard of Lynn Riggs until now? So Lynn Riggs um, was a Cherokee person, who Cherokee man who was gay um, and who lived in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, actually um, came from Oklahoma, lived in New York, wrote, wrote these really lovely pastoral pieces um, and in particular... Uh, wrote a piece called Green Grow the Lilacs. Does anyone know that one? No musical theatre people here. Um, uh, you will know the musical that it became. But this is somebody who used land back, this notion of land back, to make all of the work that he ever made. He was able to be a writer and kind of get through producing all of these wonderful works about how great Oklahoma was and uh, was able to do this work because he had an allotment that was made available to Cherokee people and he you know, effectively rented it out and was able to, to use that income to be able to survive. And Lynn Riggs only in the last two years has been 
really recognised within Oklahoma as somebody who was doing some pretty remarkable work. He wrote Oklahoma. I mean, this is Green Grow the Lilacs. So it's this pastoral story. And I mean, Oklahoma itself is this amazing space. You know, it's got a governor who's native, um, who's an indigenous person. It's really, really conservative. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very, like a third of the, of, of the um, state is First Nations. And so it's a remarkable space in just so many different ways. Uh, and this was the centre, Lynn Riggs' work was the centre of a piece in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Centre for Queer Prairie Studies. It's, a, it's not a centre for Queer Prairie Studies, that'd be good. Um, it's an exhibition that was talking about queerness and talking about the kind of history of queerness. First, queer, first major queer exhibition in Tulsa of all things in 2023. Um, but centering Lynn Riggs out from that and talking about two-spirit people just generally and saying this is the complexity of people because of course it is. But it's also the complexity of people who leave, but it's the complexity of people who then write back into. You know, Oklahoma was meant to, uh, Oklahoma, like 27 different states in the US, has a, a native name. So 27 of the states have native names, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Illinois, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas. Um, these are all native names and Oklahoma was meant to be a First Nations um, state. And then the reason it took so long isn't quite what they said in the musical. You know, it is basically because they didn't about turn and turned it into something else, um, which is a, a colonial state that has now a massive amount of federally recognised tribes. Just in the last 10 years, there are twice as many federally recognised tribes as there were before the last 10 years across the US. So it's re got remarkable growth. So I'm um, circling back around to Bronwyn Carlson with Monumental Disruptions. Yeah, it's Tony Allen. Off you go. Um, so Monumental Disruptions, if you don't know it, is, I mean, you might be wondering why on earth I'm talking about something that's about bringing down statues. I'll, I'll get there. But this is a book around bringing down statues, which you probably know is currently or about to happen in Tasmania, um, the first it's not quite the first. I want to think that the Captain Cook statue in Cairns is <laughs> like one of them, but uh, but it's certainly the first high-profile one that's that's been centred and, and structured by um, by the city or by the state, city or state. Um, this book is is really remarkable um, in a whole lot of ways, and one of the ways that it's remarkable is this is the work that you can do if you want to think about gender neutrality. Bronwyn published this with IATSIS, so uh, Aboriginal, uh, uh, Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. So it's published through there, it's a major publisher. Um, and she spent quite a lot of time arguing um, the importance of using uh, they, them for everybody who was, in, who was named in it, um, unless they explicitly said otherwise. Uh, because she said, I'm not going around and checking every few weeks that people are still using those pronouns, and we're going to use the APA7 model, which is to say that we use they, them, if we don't know people's pronouns. And we're not assuming anyone is uh, anything, we're assuming, in fact, that we don't know their gender. And there was resistance, in spite of the fact that they use APA7, there's often resistance from publishers even though they say they use a model that actually requires people to use they, them, rather than um, binary gendered pronouns. Um, and she persisted. Uh, and it is published using they, them. And they would say things like, um, you know, don't you think that such and such probably uses he, him? Roman said, I don't know. Um, I don't know what they're going to say into the future. This is, there's a reason why this is used. It's a way to say that the colonial structures of pushing people in the way that they're described into these boxes is actually unnecessary. It's not adding anything to it. If we'd looked at that stuff that was written about the museums, if we'd seen Jill's work, and it started with it, actually, in the talking about Lion Man, I don't really clock that, but if they'd continued, if she'd, she'd continued to say, 
um, which is an example of someone who said, please, I can, um, is, uh, you know, if she'd continued to do that, then I would say mm, that would work. You know, it is an object. Um, so, so, so this is the kind of um, anti-colonial work that matters. You know, it's not the only one in this. This is about um, bringing down statues. This is about these commemorations that are outrageous. And, you know, so to use language that she has a problem with um, to describe that is, of course, equally outrageous. Oh, a queer ass, please do the survey. Um, yeah, I'm sure people have seen it. It was just off my um, social media. But I, I wanted to talk about surveys just to finish off and just to scoot through a couple of images about some work that's happening as a part of the, the project. I've got a couple of surveys, actually, another one that's about to come out that asks about queer um, Indigenous artists, specifically. Um, but this is why we have to have surveys, um, because people like this will say, um, what if you know, non-binary people, what if they say from only having 120 responses, 110 responses they had that were non-binary, that non-binary people are twice as likely to not put out their bins on time? I mean, why are they asking a fucking question about putting the bins out for a start? But also, but also, honestly, um, when there was very, very low representation from the Chinese community, what Australia Talks did was went and did um, a whole lot of survey group groups. They, they did targeted work, which they could have done here. They chose not to. They chose not to, and they will always choose not to. Whoever will always choose not to, because there's no one in the room. Like our one finding out of the uh, Queer As survey process and the work that we did before it is the same as my museums project all those years ago. If you don't have someone in the room who comes from the community, they don't get it right. You know, if you're not listening to people, if you're guessing at it and you're setting those boundaries yourself, you're going to get some of this wrong. And that's not to say that one person is the solution to it. It's not that. It is about the complexity of responses. And also, I never put the bin out. So we've got um, this idea of bold conversations, Aboriginal trans kid, really, really hard to hear um, people say those words. Uh, except it's not at all for any of us. <laughs> you know, so obviously what we've done is we've centred people that work with us. Um, I mean, people who work on this. So um, queer Aboriginal toddler, an Aboriginal trans toddler. Um, we do this work of pride and protest. We talk about the importance of saying, actually, we can challenge stuff and celebrate at the same time, because of course we can. We know how to do that. Aboriginal people know how to do that. We know how to be pissed off about something and celebrate it. We do it every year, you know, January 26. It's not hard, but there, is so, there are all of these resistances about, we won all of this. As queer people, everything's good now. So why are we having to challenge this? And of course, it's nonsense. You know, there's not only slippage for trans people, obviously, there's slippage for, you know, for cis people as well who are queer. And there's slippage for all sorts of communities that are poorly represented. Um, there is uh, within that. And that's what we'll be focusing on with queer as, yeah, look, we're interested in all of it, but I'm really interested in how asexuality or aromanticism is framed because it's not framed very well because there are problems with the way that this is described. So rather than just a list, there is a list, but rather than just a list, lists can be the colonial project. They can be the thing that you shove into something and then you don't have to think about it again. It all fits tidily. And we want to look at the bleed. We want to look at the truth. You know, and the truth is complexity um, with this. We're doing the Dignity Project as a part of this too. Uh, that's, that's my brother who, who um, died last year. And did this work on Bold, but we've set up this fantastic research fund. Uh, I know some of you in the room have heard me talk about this before, but, you know, and yes, it's called the Dignity Fund. You know, we're focused really on that idea of how queer Indigenous people, and it will help queer non-Indigenous people, of course, because it will, um, are treated with respect um, when they're in aged care, when we're in aged care, when we uh, are having to work within a system that doesn't support and doesn't understand the intersecting um, reality of identities, but we're also dealing with the other most crucial thing 
for queer Indigenous people, which is housing um, and housing precarity. Um, working with PGDC, um, the wonderful Parents of Gender Diverse Kids, to develop a suite of material. Uh, I keep saying a suite of material, it's not pamphlets, I promise. Um, we're actually doing this remarkable work with Molly Hunt, who, oh, I don't have any of um, Molly's images, but except actually that behind um, is uh, one of Molly's works. Uh, Molly's a, a, a queer Indigenous artist who is working on this story in um, comic form that answers the single question. We asked people all of these questions, right? And we said, you know, what are you most concerned about? Everybody, almost everybody said one thing. They said lots of things, but they also said one thing, which is we're worried about, um, we're worried that the community is going to say there didn't used to be trans people and now there are trans people and where did, we, where did they come from? Talk about the kids. And, you know, we don't know how to talk to the health organisation, Aboriginal Controlled Health Org or other org, um, and so we're worried about this and is it right? And especially when the caregivers are non-Indigenous and we have a lot of kids in out-of-home care. And so it's, there can sometimes be a conservatism attached to that, a worry that there's an overstep in terms of culture. So, of course, in this comic, it's like a time machine. But you go back and you meet the transcestors. And you go forward and you meet people into the future. And it's that idea of reinforcements of, yes, if, if people are here now, then what was happening in the past and what is happening in the future? It's a reinforcement of that. Um, uh, this issue of complexity of language, I've already talked about it a bit, but I wanted to kind of mention um, Percy Lazard with this. There's an amazing um, report that got reconfigured to include um, in the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, um, also two-spirit LGBTQIA plus peoples. It was reframed in that way and, uh, and it's, it's a remarkable report. And of course, it was a bunch of queer Indigenous people who said, look at the statistics. It's happening to us too. Look at this. Um, and it's actually happening to us in the same kinds of numbers. You know, and again, this isn't, you know, the Olympic suppression. This is about gendered violence. Um, and it's about violence that occurs in very specific ways. And, uh, and we're hopefully taking up the mantle here. It's, we're not quite there yet, but there is work that is being done to ensure that we're recognising that, again, gendered violence is gendered violence. Um, it's not, you know, women deserve to, for this not to be framed as a woman problem, you know, or a problem for women. They deserve more than that. This is gendered violence against women and other people. Um, trans or cis, uh, women or women. Um, and so I saw in this process of looking around, I, I really didn't see a lot of queer indigeneity. Um, in galleries and exhibition spaces. It was disappointing. I'm doing the West Coast uh, next month, so I'll report back. But, but we had it here. Um, and this was the Mitchell Museum just north of Chicago. And there was beginning to be discussions. Look, I'm interested in museums because they're really conservative and a bit useless. And they kind of get things wrong all the time. And so I'm interested in them because there's work to be done. You know, there, and you can sometimes see what people believe that the community can tolerate, you know. And so I'm always intrigued about how that gets framed. So, um, thanks. I think that's it. Uh,